So if you have questions, you can certainly put them in the um, chat. I'll be checking on that. And um, as Zaida said, we are recording this, so it'll be available for other folks um, from your class. Um, I am Erin Duffy. I'm the Director of Career Services and Employer Relations at the Hubbard Center at Tapa. Um, I'm also a very proud 1990 grad. Um, and I'm not going to do a whole lot of talking, so I'm going to actually pass this off to our moderator, Kyle Robbins, who is the class of 2013. And let mm -hmm. him tell you all a little bit about himself and then um, introduce our panel. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I'm just glad that I had my microphone on mute. I've done that five times already today, started talking. Um, I think we're all used to that at this point. So uh, yeah, excited to be with all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kyle Robbins. I am a 13 grad uh, from DePauw. Uh, so while my hairline keeps arguing otherwise, I'm not that far um, removed from your shoes. Um, uh, today, I'm the VP of sales at a software company in Indianapolis um, called Paxe. Um, we've been in existence for about uh, almost six years now. Um, I've been at Paxe that entire time. I actually joined Paxe while I was finishing my law degree. Um, so uh, today, I, I run a, a team of about 10 here at Paxe. Um, we're a company of about, um, about 50 people. Um, We've been rapidly scaling and growing. So if you have questions about the software space, um, what it's like uh, transitioning from uh, having no clue what you want to do and falling, up, uh, falling into a, a, a software job and what that looks like, uh, I can give some background and context to that today. But um, at DePaul, uh, I, was in, uh, I was a member of the golf team. Uh, I did a lot of stuff at WGRE. Uh, I was, my background was actually in sports broadcasting. That's all I wanted to do coming out of college. Um, I found out really quickly that I did not want to live in Holiday Inn Expresses every single night of my life. So thus I do this now. And uh, let's see, I'm looking at our prompts just real quick to refresh. And uh, yeah, other student orgs, I was, uh, I was a member of Delta Tau Delta fraternity and uh, participated in IFC pretty heavily and, and, and a few other things around DePaul. But um, yeah, I'll go ahead and introduce the rest of our group. Uh, started off with um, Kiaria, if you want to say, hey, give a little background on yourself and um, let us know the same couple questions. What do you do now? And um, what did you do at DePaul? And uh, what led you to, to, to being with us here today? Thanks, Kyle. Hi, everybody. My name is Kiera Asiadu. I graduated from DePaul in 2011. Um, so I'm a little bit further than Kyle, but I promise you I'm not that old and removed. Um, currently, I'm the Director of Matriculation and Onboarding um, at an education nonprofit, Teach for America. Um, prior to that, I was a Chicago Public Schools teacher. Um, at DePaul, I double majored in Communication as well as Education Studies. Um, and I was the president of Excel Step and Dance team during my tenure there, and then as well as the treasurer for AAAS um, and, you know, on a couple of other student orgs on the campus. Um, so what else, what else, what else? Um, yeah, so now in my role as the director of matriculation and onboarding, I help to support um, somewhere between 100 and 130 30 new teachers um, to matriculate into the Chicago public and charter school system, um, getting them enrolled in graduate courses so that they can earn a master's as well as um, partnering with Chicago public schools and Ch Chicago charter schools in order to place and retain teachers. Awesome, thanks. Uh, next up, I'll introduce uh, Matt Fisher. Uh, Matt, wanna give us kind of same sort of question. Uh, background on what are you doing today? When'd you leave, uh, when'd you graduate from DePauw? And a uh, couple things that you did when you were uh, on campus in Greencastle. Sure, so uh, nice to be with you all tonight. Uh, so I graduated way, way, way long ago in 1982, uh, before there were things called computers um, and screens and things like this. Uh, I was a studio arts major uh, and uh, realized while at DePauw that I wanted to go into advertising. I grew up right outside of New York City so the DePaul experience for me was incredible because um, I think 
I grew up in an incredibly competitive place and where the first thing they asked was what your father did. And it was really nice to go to a place where everybody was warm, friendly and welcome and no one cared what your father did. So uh, that was an awesome um, change of pace for me because I didn't realize there was another way about it. Um, and then uh, I met my wife uh, at DePauw and she was a year behind me and I was an SAE and she was a DG. Uh, so when I uh, moved back home, had a year to get a job and so found a job in an ad agency uh, after a lot of rejection, uh, but did get a start and then was in advertising until, uh, or was in New York City until 9-11 uh, happened. I uh, lost my job and uh, had to reinvent and so ended up moving to Cincinnati and became a minority partner in an agency in Cincinnati. And then the next opportunity to reinvent was called the Great Recession. And so uh, had to reinvent again. And so started my own agency called Curiosity Advertising where 60 people you can find us on the web at curiosity.fun. Um, we are all national um, advertisers uh, and national brands. Uh, we're about 60 people and we do absolutely everything. So um, we've, um, uh, it's a really fun and wonderful business to be in. And so super excited about how we're doing. When I was at DePaul, I played football. I also, um, you know, spent a lot of time as an art major, you spend a lot of time in the studio uh, doing that, but I did a semester of WGRE or you know winter term as a DJ because who doesn't want to be a DJ and um, and then I just took part in any kind of opportunities I could on campus little 500 all that stuff I just enjoyed everything and, and uh, it really enjoyed my fraternity experience it helped me figure out how to get along with large groups of people in a collaborative fashion so I'm very happy to be here tonight talking to you all. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, awesome to be with, with you as well. And uh, next up, uh, uh, Shireen, uh, same sort of question to you. Uh, background on uh, your time at DePaul and what you're doing today. And uh, you want to kind of give us a little bit of background on who you are. Shireen, you're on mute. <laughs> I was, thank you. I was going to say, do you not want to ask? All right, first one of the day. <laughs> Take the cobwebs off. It's, I really, um, when I graduated at DePaul, they just introduced me as Shireen, by the way. So um, if you want to know how to say it, it's a little bit like curiosity, shariosity, just in case. Um, but I graduated DePaul in 91. I was an English composition major and French minor. I was English comp because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought if I knew how to write well, it, you know, it would bode well for a person who was sort of looking into a bunch of different industries. I actually have had a career of a lot of different jobs, uh, partially because I had to move a lot. Um, so that did actually serve me well. Um, I right now run, have my own not-for-profit that runs large scale public events with the cultural affairs department and the mayor's office and the park district in Chicago. Um, the big one being this Saturday night. So uh, it's, it's interesting to do something like that in the COVID area, era, but I have worked mostly in the arts, I, in both the for-profit and not-for-profit side of the arts. I've been involved in some startups, have done a lot of looking for jobs for different reasons, one time, was when I moved back to Chicago from Puerto Rico right before 9-11. So that was an interesting time for me also to be hunting for a job and reinventing. But um, I loved DePa. I My favorite memory is delivering Marvins on rollerblades. I'm old enough that I was there when rollerblades were the cool thing, like the first round. So that was, that was super fun. But I, I was a Pi Phi, I, I loved I loved being there. I was on the pub board, um, publication board, um, and that's where I am today. Po probably not at my personal best right now. My brain is half out of here. So thanks for giving me a distraction from, from all the craziness of this week. I think we can all relate to that. Uh, five o'clock during the week right now, everything just feels like one big work day. Uh, I know <laughs> from Monday to Friday. So. Uh, right there with you, Shireen. And uh, last up, uh, Ted, Ted Tabakis. Uh, Ted, want to, same question. I've said it enough. I don't need to say it again, probably at this point. Everybody's catching on. No worries. Um, so yeah, hi, everyone. Ted Tabakis. Um, I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, in the northern suburbs, and graduated from DePaul in 2008. 
Um, I moved back to Chicago right after I graduated, but while I was um, at the PA, I was a Sigma Chi. Um, so Shri and you and I are were neighbors that, you know, been overlapping lives, I guess. Um, and uh, I, I, was, I was actually telling the rest of the group earlier, like I, it kind of took me a while to find my footing at the PA. So I, I didn't, I wasn't a part of a bunch of groups. I mean, I, I played tennis my freshman year, not very well enough to keep me on the team for very long. Um, but I knew I wanted to, uh, I, I chose the pod because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I chose to be a communications major, went to study abroad, trying to figure out really anything that kind of piqued my interest. Um, and really it was kind of towards the end of uh, my senior year, where I kind of figured um, some different ways where I could help out and uh, really kind of apply myself different in different ways to help the pod as well. So I became the, um, the student elected alumni board member uh, and kind of figured that I thought I wanted to go into advertising and that first advertising job, um, I was looking for it in 2008, which uh, as Matt mentioned, and part of that great recession. So that was a great job market to kind of graduate into, um, but eventually found myself working at an agency uh, who was handling on-site marketing for NASCAR, which is something I had no idea about, um, but I would go into race markets and hang out in Office Depot parking lots for a whole day with show cars and, um, you know, racing simulators and all that stuff. I had no idea what was going on, but it was a great first job. I got to travel a lot, introduced me to work cultures and, um, you know, how to basically be in uncomfortable situations that, um, you know, that required me to, to kind of learn, learn on the fly. Uh, and then after that, I, I went into media planning and buying. So um, maybe if a lot of you are communications majors or know a lot of people who've gone into Media planning, it's basically making sure that you're buying uh, ad space, digital ad space for, for major brands and, and making sure that their ads are getting seen, right? It doesn't happen unless you have uh, media planners and buyers there. So um, I started working at an agency called Mindshare on a Kimberly Clark account, um, but I quickly realized that I really wanted to get into sales. Um, it was my favorite part of the day, listening to salespeople be consultants with their with different businesses. So um, I went to a company called Vivo, which it does uh, music uh, music videos. You might have seen a lot of them, basically on the uh, on YouTube. Um, then I bounced around a few different places until uh, I landed at Amazon, where I was an account executive for three years, uh, working on uh, businesses in uh, automotive aftermarket parts and accessories and lawn and garden, outdoor lawn and garden power tools, like just a lot of different uh, clients that I'd never heard of before, but had huge businesses on Amazon. Uh, and then starting the beginning of this year, um, I moved into a sales manager role where I have a team of 10 uh, who are um, kind of in their first sales roles. And so there's a lot of uh, teaching, teaching and mentoring and trying to um, find the best practices for them to be the most successful salespeople they can be and, and get our clients to, uh, uh, to be as successful as possible on Amazon. So it's been very interesting. It, I didn't really think I'd end up here, um, but uh, but here we are now. It's going from you know not really knowing what I wanted to do to uh, working at a very very large company that also feels very small at the same time. So um, where it's very much a startup culture where um, you know where you think you you might look at a behemoth like that, but we're very much uh, liberal arts in the way that like you're, it's it's the best idea until someone else comes up with a better one, right? Um, so you're always able to uh, to influence new culture, influ influence the um, the ideas that Amazon is. Uh, is always putting forth. And so those, those sort of more customer obsessed angles where anyone has the idea to change anything. So um, I'm happy to talk to you all today and, and see how we can help, you know, figure out where, where your career can start because it certainly won't end the place where, where you thought it would. Amen. Amen to that, Ted. I, I think that's, that's great. Uh, that's great advice to, to start off here. So um Looking at our kind of list of questions, I think the thing that all of us want is to make sure that we're being helpful to all of you and giving you great insights. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. We'll get to them either at the end or, or as we chat here today. Um, I'll get us going and we'll just kind of go in the order that we inter introduced everybody. Um, I'll go last though, um, so I just don't kind of filibuster our session. Um, so first question for everyone on our panel, um, Let's let's start with a softball. Just give us maybe, hey, favorite memory at DePaul um, from your time when you were there. Um, we'll just we'll go ahead and start it off. Uh, Gary, you want to you want to take that one? Yeah, it's so interesting because I have so many good memories that choosing one <laughs> probably is hard. Um, I would say um, 
I will choose the memory that made me fall in love with DePaul, which was my freshman year, 2007, we won the Monon Bell. Um, so it was the best way to start my freshman year of college ever. <laughs> um, the campus just came alive. And I think that weekend I met at least three fourths of the campus. Um, there was just so much love and so much joy and everyone's just truly excited to just be a part of the same school. Like it was just so much pride um, and so much love. And then I fortunately had the opportunity, I stayed on Humbert Four, which um, also housed a lot of the um, freshman football athletes from our year. And so I just had a lot of like sweet mates who I was just really excited for, really, um, hyped up for and so had a really great um oh yeah that Humber life is real <laughs> um, it was until now until you all have those nice sweet buildings now Humber was the creme de la creme of of dorms <laughs> when I went to DePaul um it was the absolute um Marriott of dorms um so definitely enjoyed winning the Monon Bell my freshman year. It really set me up for um, a wonderful celebratory four years at DePauw. Matt, how about you? Well, I think I would be remiss if I didn't say I met the love of my life there. So for 37 years, um, and it took me a few months to convince her that I was the right guy for her, but um, she is the cement walls to my watercolor world. And uh, I can't imagine where my life would be without her, but it's really cool when you share the same friend groups and all those same memories. Um, so I would say that that absolutely has to stand out for me. Absolutely. Uh, Shireen, how about you? Um, I would say, and I gave a little bit of my favorite memory with the rollerblading, so I'll give you another. Um, I guess I love this memory because I'm still very good friends with so many of my friends from freshman year that I lived in the dorm with. And they still make fun of me because I spent the entire first day when I moved in, I have a very strict, like grew up with strict parents. And I was frantically trying to find out what the curfew was. I like the idea that there wasn't one was so beyond me that I kept asking people and they kept, they were, you know, they just give me these joke answers. And finally, you know, the, like we had gotten to know each other on that first day enough that someone was like, Shereen, there isn't a curfew. And so it's just, it's like been my connection to my friends in so many ways. It's been the, you know, the ongoing joke for so many years now. So it just, when I think of that, it makes me remember how much I loved just connecting with people and how happy I am that I'm still, you know, part of the same group of alumni from school. Amen to that. That's one that I can definitely relate to. Ted, how about you? Um, I had two, uh, Two Monon victories, so that was pretty great. One was on a last second 47 yard field goal, so that was awesome. It was a ESPN top play, so that was pretty rad. Um, but I think uh, for me, still the most memorable parts of DePaul were though that maybe five or four days, maybe six days or a week if you were bored before um, before school even started. So moving back into the house and spending time with everyone, catching up over the summer, um, getting your room ready, uh, you know, getting really hydrated. And like, I think those times were just probably the, the most fun I, I will ever have, right? Just, just the lack of responsibility at that point and just real connections that you make over, uh, over the rest of that year. And it was, uh, I still can't believe that we were allowed to be there by ourselves and without curfews. Um, so yeah, it's uh that that's probably the memory I I will absolutely keep with me all, at all times. Yeah, Ted, that, that's that's another good one. Um, for for me, I would I'm trying Ten to college. Yeah, yeah. amen. Yeah. Um, for me, I'm trying to I'm trying to come up with just one instead of like six here, um, and trying to figure out which ones I can actually retell on this setting. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip many of them, but um. For me, I can relate to a lot of what Shireen said. Um, I still have a group of friends that probably is is almost 20, 20 folks deep, um, where we all either live in Indianapolis and Chicago, and probably, you know, at least once a month, uh, half of us get together um, on a Saturday when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and, you know, all the memories that I can trace back to my fraternity experience while 
um, you know, there are certain things um, about that that I think can be improved always in terms of when we look at Greek, Greek, Greek life. I was really thankful that I had a group of well-rounded, diverse people that were around me that um, I was a small town kid coming to DePaul University and I was thrown into a lot of new, um, a lot of new perspectives um, that helped me grow as a person. Um, I was an only child, still am. Um, and so just being able to be around all these people that have turned into my best friends um, all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, probably if I have to point to one, uh, I am not going to lie. We did go skinny dipping in Brian Casey's pool uh, on my last night that I was at DePaul University that I was the first one in the pool. And that is still to this day, the only time where I have done the daring thing out of my friend group. Um, and I still don't know what got into me at that point, but, um, that is probably one that I can, that I can flag and stay, uh, that night still the last night after we graduated and that'll still stick in my head forever. And, um, just an awesome memory and an awesome experience. So, um, that one was always, always really fun. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess Brian's not there anymore. So the president's house, um, I, I assume all of you, I can't remember when he left or any of that anymore. Um, so transitioning, awkward transition for me talking about um, jumping into the, the president's pool at 3 a.m. to talking about your postgraduate plans. Uh, trust me, it was just as rough a transition for me. Um, Gary, I think we were talking about you went to work like two days later after you graduated. Excuse me. Um, sorry, getting more call. Um, you went to work like two days later, and I think I went to work three days after graduating. Uh, that was not a thing I would ever recommend. So in that spirit, um, what would be the one thing about your time at DePaul or one thing you did just as you were graduating when it came to your postgraduate plans that you might do differently if you had it to do over again? Um, Gary, I'll start, start with you since we were just talking about that quick jump into working that we were sharing the other day. Yeah, um, I think that the one thing that I absolutely loved about DePaul was the fact that it was a liberal arts college. And so really the sky is the limit, right? You can be in economics one minute, you can be in sociology the next minute, you could be studying art, you could be studying science, you can literally take your pick of the litter of what you wanna do. And there's so many opportunities um, and so many extracurriculars that you can participate in. Um, and so the one thing that I would do differently is um, I was really into social justice and that the, 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 like our motto on common success was really like scoured into my brain when I was there. And so I was like, you must master one thing, right? You got to master one thing. And that one thing for me was being able to um, teach. I wanted to be able to teach. Even though I was a double major, I majored in comm as well. And I was really interested in like rhetoric and doing speech. And I, um, and I also worked in like the office of speech and writing. So helping other students with their speeches, helping other students with their writing. I really wish I would have just diversified my internship opportunities. Um, I think that the one thing that I would have done is I would have just tried different things while I was at DePauw. Um, I think that I really got into my lane of education and I only did tutoring and I only did library visits and I only worked with the kids at the elementary school in Greencastle. Whereas I really think I should have taken a comm internship, done something else, like tried out um, different things. Um, now that I am almost 10 years into my professional career, I really encourage all young adults um, to use your youth to your advantage. You are so flexible, you're so nimble, you learn so quickly. Um, take advantage of all of the different opportunities that you can, even if you feel like it's out of your zone, just try it because you really never know what might fall on you um, and what might really speak to you once you start doing the work. Amen, that's, I, 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 I had one type of internship uh, every every summer at the Paw, and was always in sports radio or communications. And within three months after graduating, I knew I wanted nothing to do with that. So I think that's always so important. Uh, Matt, how about you? One thing that you either did when you're at the Paw or just shortly thereafter graduating that you wish you would have done differently when it came to kind of career planning and well, in your it's probably not something I wish I'd done differently, but I wish I appreciated it more um, when I was in the moment, which is 
your friends are going to become incredibly influential people in the world. They're going to be incredibly successful and they're going to hire you at some point, these relationships to nurture them and keep them. So I will tell you, uh, Jim Alling, who's a pretty famous alumni, uh, was in my fraternity and he most recently was CEO of Tom Shoes, but he, at the time, I was put on the Starbucks account and at an agency in New York and I went out to meet my new client and I walked in the room and who was it but my fraternity brother, Jim Alling. And I, he's in Seattle, I'm in New York, how does this work, right? Um, and he looked at me and I looked at him and it was a pretty funny moment because everybody else in the room thought we're mortal enemies or something. Cause he's the first thing he said to me is what the hell are you doing here? And I said like, I was gonna ask you the same question. And 12 people thought it was a very awkward moment. Um, but these people are going to be incredible um, in your network for you to rely upon and all your jobs I hate to tell you, are going to come through relationships. They're not going to come through job boards. They're not going to come from Indeed. They're not going to come from scenarios. It's just relationships. And so you've got to work the relationships. And I wish I'd appreciated that more uh, when I was there. I had a ton of great friends. We didn't have things like LinkedIn or all the things that you guys had. And so we, you know, we had to rely on picking up a phone, a traditional phone, and calling each other to be able to do that. Um, I, too, get together. Uh, multiple times a year with many of these friends and many of these friends grew to powers of position or positions of power within very big companies and they've since hired my agency to do their work because they trusted me as a person as an agency so I will tell you look around and appreciate all these really cool people that you got to go to school with because they will be very helpful to you later on Amen, Matt. That, that's something I can I can give everyone real real life experience. You know, we're rapidly hiring and scaling at PackSafe right now, both on my team and and other teams within the business. And I was on a walk last night, and we're at a really critical point in our growth where I need people that I trust. And at one point, I, I made a couple offers for for um, hires that we've got out there that we're recruiting just in the past few days. And I, I'm not sure if these people are going to take the job. They're people that are in our domain and in our space, and they've got the experience we want. But at the end of the day, I'm walking around. I'm like, man, I really just need somebody that I can trust, that I can plug in. And I typed in DePaul University and a couple software sort of type titles in LinkedIn. And I just started scrolling through my phone. Like, who in my network is actually in this experience? And I sent a couple texts texts um, already to people that, hey, I know from DePaul University because I want to talk to them because I trust them. I can tell you my, um, our biggest competitor um, in the space at PackSafe, um, the global director of product marketing for that company is um, one of my good friends who happened to be the rush chair at Phi Kappa Psi while I was the rush chair at Delta Tau Delta. And uh, so he and I are on the opposite side of the fence. Once again, we keep trying to recruit each other to come to each other's company. So um, Matt, I, I hear that with that all the time. And I never would have thought that my good friend who's over there um, would be one of the most uh, powerful people actually in our space just already at, at 31 years old. And, and you know, you'll be shocked just in short order um, how quickly people at the PAW can progress in their careers and become really powerful. I've experienced that myself. Um, Shereen, how about you? Um, something that you might change, modify, do differently about getting into your career for the first time. So I I've, have a lot of jobs, um, like I said, because I moved and, and for various reasons, but I've had two different periods of sort of major job searches. One was right when I got out of school, and then the next one was after September 11th, and I was moving back to Chicago. And I did something the second time around that I wish someone had told me to do the first time around, which was I was very, very focused on just interviews, you know, ideally, obviously always for an actual job, but if not, then an informational interview. And I think those are very, very good. But I would, you know, back in those days, you wrote a handwritten letter. I think your generation has an advantage because no one does it anymore. And it makes you stand out probably to do that. Back then, you know, I was good about sort of following those steps you're supposed to follow, sent, an inf sent a thank you note right away whether or not there was actually a job there. But I sort of, if I didn't get the job or if there wasn't a job available, I just, you know, I thought I, I gave the thank you, I moved on and just kept moving on until I finally found something. The second time around, I had 
even more just informational interviews, no one was hiring at that time. And I had maybe a little bit better of a sense yeah. about what I wanted to do, but um, you know, I was making kind of another shift. But what I decided is that I was gonna keep in touch with those people who didn't hire me or they didn't have a job for me. Um, just you know, kind of let them know periodically, not so much that it's annoying, of course, but just a little note here or there to say, hey, I'm, you know, I met something, I'd read something about their company, you know, anything, not even because I really wanted to work there, just to sort of continue the relationship. And I have found, I mean, some of those people, so that was in, you know, 2001. Yeah. Some of those people are, you know, our clients now, Matt, sort of like, like you're saying, and Kyle, it's, they've been, I've been in fundraising positions where they've been sponsors for me. They, you know, I would let them know when I was moving on to another job, even if it was three years later. And it's that whole group of people. I feel like I built something of like a cabinet. I think that's good to do. Like even I've switched into different, um, you know, I worked for an art auction house as my first job doing business development. I later ended up launching an art, you know, or not an art, like a local version of eBay for Puerto Rico. There was no real connection between an art auction house and an online auction site. But um, I, what I found is that the areas that I didn't know about, I had by then built up um, some, just my expert, my tech expert that I could go to and get advice about who I should talk to or you need to go to Comdex and you know learn everything you can about this or my you know financial or spreadsheet person or my like top of the line salesperson who could just give me some news and I, I still use that what I do think of as my cabinet my personal cabinet so that if I ever do want to launch into something else I'm so sorry about this if I ever do want to launch into something else as long as I know what the skills are that I need and of course I do the research and you need to you know now especially with YouTube and there's so much you can learn online so I don't kind of go there with please give me a you know an accounting 101 lesson but I do the research I can do but I know I have someone that I can trust who I can go to to say I want to take on this new role or I want to find a place here can you walk me through some things and you know give me the best advice you can give me and um, again that really a lot of that was a part of just maintaining relationships with people who were in various areas that I met along through my job search. And it's, I wish someone had told me that earlier. So that's my advice. Amen. I can, can totally relate to that. Ted, how about you? So um, when I graduated in 2008, I decided I was going to take one more summer and teach tennis. So I've been doing that since high school through college. That was my summer job. I'd done internships during winter term, like I, you know, was building up different connections there than anywhere that I could, but I just really enjoyed that one part of it. So of course I was like, oh, okay, I'll just, you know, do this for one last summer and, you know, kind of get some under the table money and have a good time and whatever. And then the fall of 2008 hit, and that was when we kind of went into the recession. Um, and it, <laughs> it really delayed some plans a little bit more. Um, so if I were to do it again, I, I, I might try and have a job search earlier. Um, that seems like a far cry from, from what I think I should say, but I'm getting to this, right? Like just be patient with yourselves, right? So every day that you don't feel like you have a job or a plan, it feels like a lifetime. Um, but looking back over it now, like it's, it's, it's a blip, right? And it taught me a lot about how I interact with people, how I reach out, how I introduce myself, how I tout myself, my, any of the accomplishments that I didn't think I even had then, but can um, sell myself as well. Um, I had another phase where I was laid off. And again, that was another pretty bad job, um, uh, uh, job economy or job growth economy. So those times where I didn't have work felt awful at the time. But now that I look back at them now, I understand what that growth was during those times. And so my only request to you all is if you're, if you're frustrated by the search, you're frustrated, no, no one's giving you yeses, um, just be patient with yourselves, right? It'll happen. Uh, I think Shireen made a really great point of just kind of giving quick follow-ups to people. Like you never know, you heard, a, you heard a no five months ago, you check back in every, every quarter, right? Like every month or whatever. 
Um, and you never know what those people might say. They appreciate the, the follow-up. They may have heard, heard of another job in a different company. So it's just that consistency is key. Um, but my main thing is just be patient, like find what you really want to do. It's always easier to get a job when you have a job. That's probably one of the things that no one really tells you. Um, so uh, take what take what interests you. Like don't just take any old job just for the sake of it. Um, but if it doesn't perfectly align with what you're trying to do and your perfect career goals of wherever that may line up, um, just be patient. You continue to grow your network over the course of your career. It's not you're not a finished product at all. I'm not a finished product. No one on this on this panel is a finished product. Um, so patience with yourself is what I would preach. I'm finished. I'm too old to uh, start. <laughs> uh, but I'll say this, you can do something about this, right? So Daniel Kahneman, who is a Pulitzer, or not a Pulitzer, a Nobel Peace Prize winning father of, of behavioral sciences, did an experiment in England where he took a thousand people and he said, 500, go find your dream job and tell us how long it took. And the other 500 said, you guys are going to do the same thing, except you're going to keep a diary. Once a week, we want you to write what is you're going to do this week, who you're going to talk to, how many people you're going to make connections to, all those things. Then read that diary before you start the next week about what you learned that week, what impressions changed, all those things, and then hit each week. The people who kept that diary found their dream jobs 60% faster than the people who didn't because it's a, an amazing form of self-accountability. Like I would be tempted to go play golf if it was 70 degrees and sunny. But if I had a diary that was reminding me that I needed to take five people to coffee that week, I would probably do things a little bit differently. So there are things you can do, especially to keep your parents off your back, that you have a plan and you're working it um, so that they know that, you know, this is, this is a blip. Also as a business owner, we're used to creative destruction. And when creative destruction, it's usually replaced by something else. So something's dying, but something's growing. And so there's a transition that's happening. We've never had forced destruction, which is what this is. Never, and as a business owner, I usually used to view government as, uh, I, it was a dependable thing that I knew how they were going to behave. Therefore, I could run my business knowing how government was going to act and, and be a part of my life. This is a whole new deal where every moment they can announce another shutdown or this or that and the other take away things. And so um, this is all new for everybody. And so I think you, to Ted's point, give yourself a pass, right? Just keep working it. Relationships will be there, but this is unprecedented. Um, but the good news, I think, is the underlying economy is still really strong. We have gone nine for nine in new business pitches since all of this started. So People are spending money, people are marketing, people are doing things. Certain sectors got hit much harder than others. But look, you know, don't live in fear, live in where's the, where's the opportunity within the chaos, because there's plenty of it, truly is. Amen, amen, Matt. And, and yeah, there's a lot, Ted, that you said there that I can relate to directly on one piece of advice. And we'll kind of transition to our kind of our last I think one of our last questions here and then open it up for Q and A. Um, but I can relate to a lot of what you're talking about on putting pressure on yourself to find something early. I actually interviewed for one job when I was at the PAW and I took it and it was in February before my senior year. It was the worst job I ever took. It's the biggest mistake I've ever made. It actually turned into probably the best thing that's ever happened to me because I made that mistake. Um, but I just wanted to have a job. And so I took this sales job working for the Indy Star here in, in Indianapolis. It was just absolutely miserable. It wasn't a good fit for my skills. And I really, I got really lucky the way the cookie crumbled, uh, the cookie crumbled that I was able to go back to law school. Um, I worked in a sports, for a sports agency for a little bit while I started that process. And I just kind of lucked out um, that that worked out for me and I bounced back in a good way have a little faith that that can happen for you too. And don't put a ton of pressure yourself to take the first thing that you find, find something that fits your skill set. And I wish I would have known that earlier on that Kyle, if you don't start work the day you graduate, it's okay. Um, it's okay to give yourself a little bit of time to figure this out. Cause I'll tell you too, right now you got a bunch of opportunity uh, in front of you and transitioning. You know, if you go to graduate school, if you take another option, if you try to do something that, you know, you've got a lot lower risk of failure, the stakes are fairly low when you come out of college. Um, obviously, they're always going to increase. You know, once you have a career, it's hard to leave and 
I have a lot of friends right now that are going back to MBA school. It's really hard to do things or pivot or make changes once you get further up the chain. Understand you've got a lot of freedom and flexibility right now and the different ways that you can go. And um, all of them can be good options, even if you end up making a mistake. I did. Um, you'll end up learning from it and it'll lead you to where you want to go. Uh, best advice I ever got about my career was at every decision that you can make, leave as many doors open as you possibly can. Make the decision for yourself that's going to allow you to leave. If you just have to shut one of the eight doors, the next seven are open. That's how I've tried to make decisions in my career. What led me to going back to law school, frankly, was I knew I didn't even know that I wanted to practice law. It led to me being a VP of sales at a legal software company. But what I knew is that was an opportunity for me to leave as many doors open to possible future opportunities as I possibly could. So with that, hey, we'll transition to kind of one more one more question that I think we wanted to open it up to all of you. Um, Gary, I'll go back to you. What advice would you give in this time in, in particular about in the economic environment we're in, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, we're all living at home, we're all interacting via Zoom. What advice would you give um, the class of 2020 grads in the room on how to find an opportunity um, in this environment? Yeah, I think that much of what like Ted and you all have been saying really resonates with me. Um, I honestly think about my transition to Teach for America. Um, short story, when I was a senior, I actually applied and made it through round three of Teach for America's interviews. I remember being in the ballroom teaching my sample lesson to like six or seven Teach for America employees at the time. A week later, I got an email that said I did not get in devastated. Um, let me just be clear, that was the first and last no I've ever gotten in my life. Um, because what I did from there was I, I really honed in on my network, my friends, my roommates, um, and the network of teacher of, prof, of professors. And um, I worked for Kara Setchell while I was there as a mentor. I really honed in on my network. And I used my network. Um, from me transitioning, me getting into Chicago Public Schools was because of Kara Setchell. Um, me getting into Northwestern was because of her husband, Steve. Me um, transitioning from the classroom to, back to Teach for America, so now Teach for America writes my checks after they told me no. Um, me transitioning to Teach for America was because of um, my roommate who actually worked for Teach for America um, after my fifth year of teaching. And so staying in contact with your professors, staying in contact with your roommates, staying in contact with your friends is probably the most important thing to do. It can feel a little weird if you if your friends have jobs and they're working nine to fives or they're in graduate school and you're not and you haven't quite figured it out yet, but keep talking to them because the more that they get steeped into their work cultures, the more that they learn of opportunities that may appeal themselves to you. Um, and so it's really important to catch up with your friends, see what they're doing, see what they've heard about, any opportunities, because I can guarantee if they know that you're looking and you are doing an earnest job of actually making sure that they are well aware of where you are and you are well aware of where they are, they you are going to be the first person that pops up in their mind when a job that fits your description comes up. Um, you're going to be the first person that they pick up the phone and call. Um, literally, I got a call on a random Monday night. My roommate was like, Teach for America is hiring coaches. I know that you've been coaching for Chicago Public Schools. How much is CPS paying you? I'm gonna talk to the manager of hiring and see how much she can get you. Um, and literally, I barely had to even do an interview before Teach for America hired me. So make sure that you're staying in contact with your professors. To this day, I'm still friends with my, at, with my two advisors who I had, um, Professor Worthington. Um, and when I say, if a job pops up, he's like, are you happy? Are you happy? I heard about this job. Are you happy? <laughs> um, and it's trying to constantly, and it's constantly there for me in my corner. Um, so just make sure that you're staying in contact um, with the people in your lives, with the people, with the networks that you built at DePaul, because those people are going to make sure that when opportunities present themselves, that you're the first person up on the docket. Amen. Can relate to that one. My job came from a text to one of my DePaul friends who happened to see that PAX, this small legal technology company in Indianapolis was hiring. So um, amen on that one. Matt, how about you? 
So I think there's a couple of really quick things. One is you've heard a lot about reinvention tonight. Everybody in this room has had, re has had to reinvent multiple times in their career. So it happens every seven to 10 years. You can't avoid it. The world, more change has happened since you were born in technology than any other given point in time. And it's going to continue to accelerate. So you have to just be it cool with change and reinventing because it's just going to happen. Number two, to build on the last comment, um, you, you all might not realize this, but companies spiff their employees for recommendations for hire. Why? Because they're trusted people. You're not going to recommend a friend who's a jerk um, to work with you. So we do it at Curiosity. My daughter, who's at Gray Advertising in New York, if she recommends a project manager that they hire, they will give her an $8,000 bonus. You better believe she's thinking about her friends from Miami of Ohio that she graduated with three years ago who have those skill sets and she's going to try to connect them and make sure she can do that. So you already have people working for you. You just don't know it yet. And the last thing I would tell you is don't call it networking, call it friend making. It's a lot easier. They'll know you're unemployed. They'll know you're looking for a job and they will help you make connections and be able to do that. So just take the onus off of it and, and the sliminess feel because some people be like, oh, it's too silly. Well, then just call friend making and just get out there and make as many friends as you can make. And I guarantee you, you're going to find some connections. Friend making. I like that a lot better uh, than networking, Matt. That's a good one. Shireen, how about you? Um, so speaking of friend making, I feel my experience right now, and I'm not looking for a job right now, but I have found my peers. I find myself. I think there's so much compassion for your class right now. Anyone who just graduated and hasn't found their first thing. This is a time I think you also can cold call people. I mean, I, if there's someone at a company you can find, do a little research, see if you can find something else about them. I've gotten a lot of just absolute out of the blue emails from people saying, you know, I just graduated. It's such a weird time. I'm interested in what you're doing. Can you tell, you know, anything. I have not said no to a single person and I try not to say no to people. Sometimes when you're so busy, you can't do that. It's always, of course, helpful to have, you know, it's a DePaul graduate or it's someone who went to my, you know, something, if there's some connection that you can find, then great. But I think there is no better time than right now to call, shoot for the stars. And I have found actually over the course of my career and, and job searching, Sometimes the people at the high up end are actually more willing to take time for you and respond to you than if you're writing people at a, at a lower or, you know, middle level. Like you would just be surprised if you can, you know, write something compelling and heartfelt and not a sob story, but just simply like, I just love your ear for, you know, over a Zoom, over an email. Can I ask you a few questions? Anything? I think you'll be surprised at how receptive people will be right now. So I would do that. And again, stay in contact where you can, send them an update, you know, anything. But but this is a great contact building time. Absolutely. Yeah. Friend making time. Sorry. Friend making. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can tell you my my LinkedIn inbox, um, I get notes all the time. And there's hardly few that I'm turning down. If I've got space, I'll tell folks, just give them my cell phone number, call me in the evening. And normally, I'm just sitting around here out on a walk and happy to take a chat. Ted, how about you? Um, yeah, it's fun. So I think what Matt actually said it really resonates in the fact that if you set yourself with these mini goals of being able to accomplish certain things while, while you're searching and while you're friend making and doing all these things, when you get into the opportunity to get in the room or, or in the room or, um, or some kind of meeting and someone says like, so what are you up to? Um, it's, it's always more impressive to say, I've been doing this, 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 and this while I'm trying to prepare for a job, right? So whether that's getting uh, Google Ads certified, I'm just talking more specifically in, in, in my field, right? Google AdWords certified. Um, it's certified within the Amazon advertising space. So if you want to get uh, it all at a job with any consulting or with Amazon at all, right? Um, we're always kind of in a hiring, um, a hiring phase too. So, um, but the e-commerce space is huge. And so to be able to, the ability to say, I have gotten certificates in these places, so I'm ready to roll. Like, what, what do you got for me, right? Um, to be able to set yourself up with these goals, to, to treat it like it is your job, 
not in the sense for like, you know, you have, uh, you know, you give yourself your own demerits or whatever, if you missed on a goal or something like that. But when you are talking to people who are hiring managers um, or people who are higher up at different companies, you can have a very specific thing that you're saying about what you've been doing as you've been searching for a job and how you've been able to uh, continue to better yourself. Um, there's a leadership principle um, within Amazon called learn and be curious. And so the ability for you to take on um, and want to be, want to learn new tasks that are outside of your own comfort zone are probably the most impressive things that you could ask for, for a new person coming in and anyone coming out of college, right? To show that you have the flexibility uh, to step into any role and want to learn exactly how it happens, even if you have no goddamn clue of what it is, um, your ability to show that I've been able to take on new things really, really well with with structure, um, measure my own results, and know exactly, um, even I don't know what I'm doing, I know who to ask, I know how to ask, and I know how to earn those people's trust. So um, treat your time now with these actual goals that you can share with people when you do end up asking them for jobs. Yeah, Ted, that's, I think that's a huge one. It's a piece of advice that I always give on trying to differentiate yourself, do, doing something to make yourself stand out, whether it's on a resume, when you reach out to somebody, when it comes to actually, you know, getting hired as a first time um, person out of college, there's, I can tell you at small companies, especially, we're guilty of it at, at PackSafe. Um, there tends to be a perception that, oh, well, hiring someone straight out of college, there's going to be things about working or basics or basic sets of skills that are necessary for a sales job. For example, if you want to get into software sales or sales in any capacity, one thing they don't teach you in college or they never taught me at DePaul University was how to run salesforce.com. If you want to put yourself slightly ahead, go out and, you know, tinker around with like getting a Salesforce certification. That's a little thing that you can do in your time. I'll tell you this, if I were looking at our entry level sales roles, where normally we say we want a year of experience, if I can find a really smart person out of college, because all of you, I guarantee you, are really smart people and absolutely can do the job. It's a, it's a misconception that, that this stuff needs to be in place, but I'm telling you how to beat it. If you can do something like that, I can easily justify saying, hey, no, we're just going to hire this awesome person straight out of college because they've got some of these basic skills that we won't have to worry about how to train them. They've taken initiative. They've shown the ability to do that. Um, and sometimes smaller organizations where there's opportunities for you to network into jobs, um, it can be, hey, if we try to hire people with experience because we don't have the time to train. If you can show that you can be a self, uh, self-driven learner, like Ted mentioned, that can help put, give you an advantage over sometimes other candidates that are just shoving the resume in the door that are, hey, they don't have much to show outside of an internship or what they did in college. Yeah, or just get a professional internship. You know, you're a graduate, but you're just still get in your foot in the door somewhere because once they meet you, they could fall in love with you and, and be able to do that. So especially in the advertising services business, that is a very common thing. We have two tiers. We have undergraduate um, program, we have a graduate program, and we know that they're here to be hired. Um, and they get to kick the tires on us, we get to kick the tires on them. But there are these opportunities. It doesn't have to be a flat out job right away. And we pay 15 to $20 an hour for those roles. So it's not without money. Um, but you just need to look for where the opportunities are and just keep turning over those stones. Something's going to lead to something. And it's just hard to see it right now, but it will get better. Amen. Awesome. Well, we're at 659. I'd be happy to hang around and answer questions. Aaron, I don't know if we're, we're allowed to do that, but I'm more than happy to sit around and, and answer some questions. Since we went a little over. We are absolutely. If you guys have questions, you feel free at this point to unmute yourself. I think if the panel is willing to stick around, I, I'd love, I'd love to make sure that what questions you have are, are being asked. Um, I have a question, probably a little bit more for Matt and Ted, but obviously anyone. Um, I'm looking to break into the advertising digital marketing space in um, agencies, and I have two internship experiences, but I'm finding that I'm still um, kind of falling short of these entry level positions because people with more experience are, um, you know, easier to hire. They don't need as much training. Um, 
so just any additional advice, advice to um, kind of push myself uh, forward to some of these entry level positions um, against people that have maybe more than entry level experience. Yeah, so I'll, can I'll ask tell a you a quick question on, on sorry, Matt, sure. can I ask a quick clarifying question on yeah. what kind of agencies you're you're interested in? Is it is it more creative based? Is it full service? Is it media planning? Um, what, what are you looking into? I'm pretty open right now. Um, I have interned at Fleischman Hillard, which is PR and then bandwidth marketing, which was more, it's small and was more full service. Um, so I'm pretty open to anything at this point. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Matt, go ahead. That's okay. So I would say, first of all, for somebody who's young, we do not hire based on experience. We, we hire based on aptitude. So we are going to ask you a lot of questions about your ability to handle ambiguity, your ability to self-learn, your ability to handle responsibility. Um, we're going to look, if we have to pivot and change our business model tomorrow, we're going to want to know that you can get on that bus without a problem. We look for people who seek to be versatile in their skill sets and to be able to do that. So I think, don't think about that you don't, you're, you, and there's a natural problem here is it's a certain group of people have to get cleared out before the next group can get their jobs. It's just, we created a traffic jam and it's, it's just going to take a little while for it to unravel. Um, I will tell you that the, what happened to Curiosity, we lost 40% of our revenue in the first four weeks of COVID-19, um, and we were in survival mode. And luckily, PPP prevented us from having to fire anybody, and we were able to be ready to, to, to get into thrive mode. And we have spent every month up until now getting back to utilizing all the capacity that we have in people. And we're finally at that point within the next month or two where we're going to have to start hiring people again. So we went from this incredible swoop. It's just going to take a little while for companies to get to the place where they're going to need to be able to hire. Somebody mentioned this earlier, get Google certified, go out and do something that's going to just give you the little bit of edge that allow you to compete with those folks. Those things matter. And the fact that you understand it and be able to do that. Um, and then we also look to see every time we talk to somebody, we, we want to measure their passion, right? So what have, you, what have you done to better yourself since the last time we talked to you? Because we really pay attention to that because no one wants to hire somebody where it's just a job next to them. Because if it's just a job for that person, you're pretty sure you're going to be doing their job um, in the next six months. And that's a downer for everybody. So you got to be able to show your passion points, right? And so um, I think uh, Ted talked about this and Kyle was like, go out there and find things that you can do that are going to be really interesting to talk about in an interview process um, that are going to make people go like, whoa, she's got some secret sauce that we want to have as part of our culture. You can do a lot uh, of interesting things to be able to do that, but you got to do it that's authentic to you. That's what I would say. Um, just be authentic to you. But um, you will, you will, the system, people are getting off the highway and it's going to be start moving again. And you just have to be prepared for that. Thanks. Yeah. yeah so Shelby, just, I'll, I'll echo a little, little bit what Matt was saying. It, 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 and there are very specific things, right, that you can do to set yourself apart. It is the Google ad certification, especially in, in uh, the way I'm thinking about this now is with, with the pandemic and everyone doing things online, e-commerce is exploding, right? So while everyone had a really tough time at the beginning of the pandemic, and I, I hate to kind of tout this one at this point, but, you know, Amazon had a really great beginning of the pandemic in terms of the business, right? Um, because everyone was doing everything online and ordering a lot of things. So um, within the e-commerce space, that part is really getting big. So the amount of agencies that are aligned to uh, to Amazon sellers and vendors who are trying to sell more on Amazon and other retail outlets uh, is getting a lot bigger. So the one place you can start is look at uh, Google AdWords, get certified within um, our own Amazon advertising uh, platform, uh, as well as you can go into these different, like Amazon has like a site of, um, uh, of approved uh, uh, agencies and tool providers that we use for a lot of our, our clients. Look into those as well and see, because if they're approved by Amazon, I can guarantee you they're getting more business than others who are not. And so find those agencies and reach out directly to them and say, hey, I'm certified while I'm looking for a job, I've been doing this, this, and this. And again, as Matt said, you know, the flexibility is something that, um, that anyone would look for in terms of a, um, a new hire. Yeah, and Ted's, that's a great comment. And I would say, become a subject expert in something, right? So 
of the nine new clients we have, eight of them or seven of them are uh, traditional brands going to DTC, direct to consumer, so e-commerce. So if maybe you become an expert on over the top video, or maybe you become an expert in some facet of, of e-commerce, because if you can walk in the room and you can talk the talk, people are gonna not care when you graduate because they're gonna know you know something. The other half are, are brands that were B2B that are gonna go direct to consumer because they've already played the DTC out and they need to build a bigger funnel at the top. So find some part of the DC, DTC world or e-commerce world that is fascinates you and become a subject matter expert at that. That will just be volumes for you in terms of an interview opportunity. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, I also have a question, um, kind of for Kyle, but also for everyone. Um, I did something similar. I um, had a job right after. And um, I don't know if this is like the most brilliant thing I've ever done, but it was like, mis it was miserable. And I realized I could not, would not be in this field anymore. Um, so I left. Um, kind of for me, but now I'm kind of wondering how, um, any advice you have for what you should go towards next? Cause this field was kind of something I had worked towards most of my college career and now it's kind of over and I worked in it and it was, I didn't like it. Um, so just, I guess any tips on to like kind of what you should look into next um, if you're not really sure. Can you, what field was it? This is a medical field. Okay. So that was lots of, uh, I have so I have a really big science background and I'm uh, didn't really like medicine much at all. It was um, wasn't great for me and I, I've tried the research thing too. So I'm kind of looking to do something different, maybe more with like social people skills, writing and reading, stuff like that. Kyle, you're on mute. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't quite make it through the entire day without doing it. Um, Sarah, no, 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 great question. Um, First thing I'll tell you is, is don't feel bad for doing that. Forgive yourself for making that decision. It's totally okay. It's an awesome thing to do. Taking that first job and figuring out what you don't want to do can be as important as figuring out what you do want to do. Um, so that's okay. I did the same thing. I actually walked away from that opportunity I was talking about earlier. Um, in terms of where to go next, I think it's... Um, I didn't know where I wanted to go next. I still, to this very day, I am now the VP of sales at a rapidly scaling and growing software company. I did not want to be a salesperson as of still three months ago. I had been doing the job for five and a half years, um, uh, continually. So I, I think, you know, forgive yourself on like ever kind of feeling like you have to figure out a career track now. My advice would be figure out what excites you today. What, what do you want to do? Something that I, I have a couple of young employees, both that are recently out of the paw, um, that are on my team. And one of them, um, she has a different makeup than me. And the question that I always ask her is, I'm a competitive person. I like getting up every day to go win something. And so therefore sales appeals to me. I ask her all the time as I'm trying to help her figure out if this is something she wants to stay in long term, if we're just kind of working together right now, because we like to work together. She likes the job, she likes the income. The question I would ask yourself is, what will make me excited tomorrow to get up out of bed and to go do something? I'm a big believer that jobs can be, you know, jobs are jobs. They put money on the table, but you'll make your life a lot better if you can find something that you do at least. You don't have to love it. I sell a click wrap transaction platform for legal software. No one on earth is passionate about terms, legal terms and conditions but I do love the fight that I'm in every day trying to build this company. And I enjoy that challenge. So if you can figure out, think about what you're good at and what your, where your skills lie. Think about what, where you're going to be passionate to get out of bed tomorrow to go chase something and figure out where those two things overlap. That would be what I would say to Chase. And it's okay if that turns into, I'm gonna go get a grad degree. I'm gonna go back. People always, the famous advice is don't go to law school if you don't know what you're gonna, gonna do afterward. I did that. Um, for me, it was all about keeping as many doors as I possibly could open. And so I'm sorry, that's not like great tangible advice. I could give you something, I wish I could give you something better, but try to figure out what that overlap is of what makes me really passionate um, to get out of bed every day. And what are the skills that I have that differentiate me, see where the overlap is. And then, you know, it's okay if you take an internship, 
you take something that's temporary. I took a nine month temporary job with a sports agency. Um, still, it's the most awesome thing that I get to tell people that I do every day. And I work with three bachelor contestants, people that ended up on it, turned, in, turned into a cool story. Um, you can find different things, be flexible about what you want to do next, whether it's going back to school, whether it's um, taking a job. I would say just get yourself out there and you'll figure it out as you go. You can always leave a job. You can always leave whatever you're doing. Just remember it's not permanent. Thank you. That's good advice. It was, I, I was hearing you talk and I remember I was sitting with my parents and I was like, I might go to law school. So when you said that, I was like, oh, that's maybe that's a normal thing that people think because for a second, I was like, am I crazy? Why do I want to do that? Yeah, that's, if you want to talk to me about that, I'm happy to talk to you about it. That's a separate conversation. Yeah, for yeah, definitely. Uh, my advice is if you can do it cheaply, then do it. But <laughs> yeah. that's a big asterisk. So um, yeah, I guess we can um, take one more question then, then, we'll, then we'll wrap up. Um, hi, I don't know if my mic is on or not. Maybe. Yeah, we got you. Okay, sorry. I can't tell because I'm on my phone right now. Um, so one of the big issues I have is kind of like planning for post-college. My initial plan had been before COVID hit was, you know, take a year off, go to grad school, um, you know, to get more education in the field that I want to go into and then start working on, um, you know, the job field, the career field. So with everything that's going on, you know, I've, I've been rethinking that. I'm thinking maybe it's better to save up money first, find a job, something that can help me pay off my student loans and then, you know, go into grad school. And I guess my question for you guys is essentially, how did you know when you wanted to go into grad school or how did you know you were making the right decision to put it off or to enter it? Um, I think I was probably one of the first people in my class to be accepted to grad school. Um, um, and honestly, I didn't know that it was the right decision at the time that I actually applied and was accepted. Um, I knew that I knew that um, I wanted to learn a new skill set, and I knew that I actually really liked doing school. I know everybody does not love school. I like school. I I actually don't mind it. Um, it's actually something that really, really excites me. Kind of like Kyle talks about competitiveness. I'm a really competitive learner. I like being at the top of my class all the time. Um, so I made the decision because I knew I wanted to learn something new. I knew I wanted to like master in a skill set. And I also thought about the like networking opportunities that you get when you go to graduate school. And so the same type of relationships that you build with your advisor professors, you get to build with more advisory professors when you go to graduate school. Um, and so it's always, um, for it's not like graduate school isn't for everybody, especially if you plan on doing graduate school while you're working a full time job. It is not an easy thing to do at all. Um, but I will say that you learn so many dual skills when you're like working a job and in graduate school or if you're just in graduate school, um, you really have the opportunity to hone in and focus in on one skill set, um, which is which is something that I just think is very different from, you know, the experience that you had at DePaul. I guess I can, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that one in terms of my decision for, for law school. I gave a Oh, of, wait, sorry. One more thing. But I yeah. also would not start graduate school a week after you graduate from undergrad. It was just not a good decision for me. Um, probably the worst decision I ever made. <laughs> so I've heard from many people. Yeah. <laughs> I'll echo that too. Uh, like Kira said, I, I took a year, year in between before I, before I go back. Um, I, that was a really critical year because I am not going to lie to you. My grades to Paul were not great. I did not really have anything to show on my resume that would have gotten me into. Um, I went to Indiana University of Mauer School of Law and still not exactly sure how they let me in the door outside of my DePaul connections and a couple great recommendation letters. And I also grew up just outside Bloomington. Um, I, I wouldn't urge you to, um, you know, grad school and law school for me was all about keeping, again, keeping as many door open, doors open as I possibly could. And I knew that law was an option, but I also knew that a couple other career tracks that I thought law school might pre prepare me for um, were options as well. So uh, to me, it's, it's, it's all about what you do while you're there. If you go just to say, well, I'm going to follow exactly what grad school tells me to do or exactly what law school tells me to do, and that's all I'm going to do, you're going to come out in the middle of that pack too. 
unless you're just a rock star student, I was not. But what, how it was, I was able to make it work for me was I went out and I decided, all right, I got three years to figure it out. I didn't figure it out in the first four when I was at DePaul. Let's take a do over, let's do this again. So I went out, I dove into my media work and for six years I was a, um, I ran two pretty prominent sports websites that were making me a fair amount of money. And I turned that into parlaying at night. I was writing about the PGA tour. I was chasing this person. At the same time, I was working for this startup software company. So I was doing things outside of just being in graduate school that bought me time. And when you paired those together, that was a really, really critical thing for helping me get where I am today. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I want to, um, great conversations. I know we went a little bit over. I'm going to put my email in the chat. So if you have any additional questions, you can email me and we can um, make sure we get some answers for you. But I want to thank you all for attending. And I want to extend enormous thanks to Kyle and Ted and Kiara, Shireen and Matt um, for taking time to be with us this evening. And I also owe a debt of gratitude to Zaida um, Benassi, who's in our alumni office and also a, a proud DePaul alum because she's awesome to work with and I didn't introduce her initially, so I apologize for that. Um, the other thing, just to keep you, you know, keep, keep the Hubbard Center in mind, um, just because you graduated from DePaul doesn't mean that we're not still here for you. We're here for you, we're here for you for life. So um, again, I'm gonna go ahead and put my email in there and I just wanna say thank you to everyone and keep us posted on how you're doing. I would like to add that um, the alumni network is there for you. Go to our website. You can search by region, city, industry, and find a list of DePaul alums that you can make connections with. Please, please reach out and search that excuse me, that DePauw um, alumni network system it is there for you, just like the Hubbard Center is. Exactly. And our alumni are amazing, wonderful, giving people who I have yet to have, I think I've had one person t tell me no, um, who, who was unwilling to help a, a student or a grad. So um, use, use those friends. And with that, I'll say thank you and have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Thanks, all. 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 Thanks, all.